The morning of July 4th, Lexi and I woke to yet another incredibly hot and humid morning. At this time of day, with the sun low on the horizon, we at least weren't bothered by the flies as of yet, which was a nice relief. But it wasn't long before we realized that overnight, we were invaded by some other unknown flying species of insect. For breakfast this morning, it was a BLT without the LT and a bit of shredded cheese just for good measure. The invading insect, however, was some type of moth, it seemed. Apparently they took up residence on the Bronco and tent overnight and were content just to hang out and stay for the morning. But my main concern was that they were maybe munching on the tent fabric, which wasn't cool. They were easily shooed away, however, but if you accidentally swatted one, they basically just disintegrated it into a mess of wing dust. With most of the moss cleared off and us all packed up, it was back onto the loop for yet another day of adventure. With the weather being as hot and muggy as it was, at least it was with clear and sunny skies. We've had some overnight rain on this trip, but nothing to spoil the adventure. When I was planning for this trip, I had downloaded all the needed maps to my Gaia app on my Android phone before setting off. Getting lost was something I really wanted to avoid. However, once we set off on the trail, it was only then that I learned that Gaia no longer had Android Auto support. Thankfully, on my old iPhone, I also had the Gaia app installed, and it supported Apple CarPlay, but I didn't have the maps saved locally to the device. In most areas, all I was able to see was some basic topography, our route, and the location icon. On this day, our first day of our summer holidays, we were about to hit a milestone with the Bronco. Delivered new in November 2021, after a year and a half of trouble-free motoring, we rolled over the 50,000 kilometer mark. Because of the navigation issues, we initially drove past the Lake Perul fuel stop marked on the route. So far from our last stop up, we were down a half a tank. The gas here on this day was $2 a liter. $60 filled us back up and the trip computer showed we covered 179 kilometers with a decent 14.5 liters per 100 kilometer fuel consumption rate. This section along the north side of the trail had some well-maintained and wide roads that allowed us to travel at a relatively more efficient speed. When I reset the tripometer at Lake Brule, it showed 391 kilometers to empty. Almost already 31 kilometers out and we were up to 399 kilometers to empty. 
a welcome relief considering our next gas stop was a long ways off yet. Even though we didn't see any logging trucks this day, this region definitely showed more signs of activity than the rest of the loop thus far. When it came to forks in the road like this one, with the map and navigation issues we were having, it was basically a 50-50 guess as to which way to go. It wasn't until you traveled far enough down the trail and your location icon came off the route line on the map that you knew you made the wrong choice or not. We eventually ended up maxing out at about 442 kilometers to empty after almost 100 kilometers since our gas stop. Before too long, however, the route took us off the main two-lane road and back into some secondary trails. A lot of the area up here was at elevation, so in some spots you could see off into the distance quite well in some of the clearings. Another one of the many critters to cross our path on this trip was this little baby groundhog. Or was that a baby beaver? Adorable, whatever it was. Yet another crossroad, but this one pretty clear on which way we have to go. We were now across the northern section and heading south, down the eastern side of the loop. Even though the road got rougher and narrower, the surface looked like a mix of dirt and packed sand with very little rock, which still allowed us some higher speeds. Of course still, some low-lying areas still puddled up, but weren't completely washed out. I was still cautious, however, not wanting to damage a tire or get a flat out here. The spotty reputation of the Sasquatch Goodyears weighed heavily at the back of my mind the entire trip. It was early afternoon when we happened upon a pull-off next to a lake that we stopped for a stretch and a bite to eat. And already getting later into the day, we were on the lookout for our next overnight spot to camp. Previously this day, we came to the Zek Pontiac gatehouse, registered and paid our entrance fee. In the reserve, we were assuming that we'd find some managed and scenic spots to set up at, and we weren't wrong. The first ideal spot we came across we pulled into. This little lot next to a natural boat launch, complete with a beautiful lake view and a fire pit. Unfortunately for us, however, the fire ban was still in place. After getting Lexi set up in her makeshift bug structure, I ventured off to the adjacent boat launch to do what I've been waiting to do for days now. I don't know what the public nudity laws are in the province of Quebec, but on this day, I gladly accept the penalty. The water was absolutely incredible. All washed up and feeling refreshed, it was looking like we were all set up in a great spot for a beautiful sunset view. It's unfortunate, however, that we had so many uninvited guests joining us. I think this day was probably the absolute worst for the deer flies we experienced on this trip. Absolutely unreal. We did the best we could and managed okay. Personally, at this point, I was feeling quite a bit of resentment towards these nasty flies. I had noticed that when one made it inside the netting, it would stupidly fly into the corner and trap itself. This was when I exacted my revenge, exposing an opening in the side of the netting just enough to encourage them inside just so I could go on an unrelenting and therapeutic murder spree. The 
following day is when I shockingly discovered my fridge went without power the entire night. It turned out that my fused Chinese Amazon 12 gauge tin copper wire that I bought to power my custom outlet panel ended up being garbage tinned aluminum 14 gauge wire. Of course, this was totally inadequate for the draw it was designed for and being fused to protect a 12 gauge can packed up and off on what I assumed would be the last day on the loop. If you were paying attention to the video footage from last night, you'll have noticed an artfully produced time-lapse scene. Well, as it turns out, after shooting that footage, I forgot to set the camera back to regular Ultra HD mode, this on the same camera I used to record from the dash. So the rest of the day's travel footage looked like this, and this, and this. And of course, this being the final travel episode of the trip, the accident on the bridge crossing that everybody has been waiting to see was also shot in time lapse. And this is how it looked. If I pull some stills from that footage, the lead up to the bridge, this is the moment it started going off on the side. And when it eventually went in, hung off the side of the bridge. And this is what one does when you realize the serious mess you just got yourself into. However, while the dash cam was in time lapse, I wanted to show what I saw and what I used to help navigate the bridge using the mirror spotter cameras on the Bronco. The camera setup is designed to show you the position of each front wheel. And as you can see, even though I'm using up the entire width of the structure, both wheels seemingly are fully on the bridge with no overhang. This is when I mistakenly believed I was good to make the crossing. But then you can see something give way on the passenger side. It was at this point I should have reversed back off, but looking at the driver's side wheel placement, I assumed I had a little more room there, so I steered over to that side and inched forward. And at this point is when the wheel actually came off the bridge and I just ended up with the wheel hop when trying to move forward. Naturally, at this point, I put the camera down, realizing the dire situation we're now in. I put the Bronco into reverse and engaged both front and rear lockers. The moment I tried to back it up, it hopped and then came completely off the bridge. I think the camera ended up in the passenger area with the dog, Lexi, who was thrown up against the door. Thankfully, I had her window up, else I'd hate to imagine how differently our exit might have been. I guess I didn't totally panic as I managed to switch the engine off and roll down my window. Naturally, I put the truck in park first out of instinct, which subsequently caused a bit of headache with the recovery. If I remain relatively level-headed, the dog, however, definitely had a panicked look to her. I literally had to grab her and throw her overhead out from the driver's side window. For whatever reason, she was reluctant to get out of the truck. It wasn't long before the inevitable water rose up past the camera and submerged it, and finally, eerily dead silence. I only managed to grab my phone before I climbed out myself, the camera rolling the entire time. Some of you may already know, we were fortunate enough to have a couple staying at their cottage about a kilometer up the road. I can only imagine what was going through their thoughts when they saw me and the dog standing in their front yard yelling for help. Of course, recording video footage at this time wasn't the most important thing on my mind, but thankfully, the first thing we did was hop in their pickup truck with a ratchet strap and some chains and headed down to the Bronco. I think I was still under the belief that at this point, the truck was still salvageable, we'd be able to get it out, air it out, and I'd be able to drive off finishing our vacation. When we arrived, the truck had already shifted some more off the bridge and was sitting like you've seen it in the initial pictures. We managed to break a chain and little else with the pickup, so it was decided we'd bring down the Bombardier tractor and give that a try. However, on our way up with the truck, we lost four-wheel drive and it got stuck. We eventually made it back down with the Bombardier to where the truck got stuck, and then it stalled out. We found out that there was probably a half a gallon of water in the gas tank, Apparently, the last time it was ran was this past winter, so it accumulated a bit of moisture since then. With the pickup truck finally recovered, we ventured back down to the bridge. 
We decided we needed to clear away some of the overgrown brush to position the Bombardier well enough to pull the Bronco away from the bridge. With the ratchet strap, I anchored the driver's side of the Bronco to the bridge to hopefully prevent it from rolling over into the water. Meanwhile, we were having transmission issues with the tractor. It seemingly just didn't want to pull very well on the Bronco. Keep in mind, however, the Bronco is in park, the parking brake's on, and it's up against a steep bank. After a few more failed pull attempts, we unchained it and headed back up to the cottage. After struggling to make it back up and overheating, we found out that the shift linkage came partially undone and wasn't allowing us to select low range. After doing a field repair with some bailing wire, we were back in business, but also coming to the sad realization that there was no way we were going to get the Bronco recovered that day. Thankfully, Nipper and Joanne put us up for the night and made us feel right at home. I don't know what I would have done without their generosity. That night I didn't sleep a wink, but it wasn't until the early hours of the morning that I thought about the local Facebook recovery pages. Why didn't I think of this already? With the spotty, almost non-existent cell service, I managed to post a pic of the drowned Bronco and the GPS coordinates on Trillium, asking for recovery help. And it was about this time that the picture of my Bronco half underwater broke the internet. But word was out, thankfully, and over the course of the day, the first of a few locals arrived at the scene to lend a hand. With a pair of full-size pickup trucks, a razor side-by-side -side with a 6,000 pound winch, and a fearless swimmer, the plan of attack was to pull with the pickups and use the side-by-side -side to help keep the Bronco from turning into the bridge. But this ended up being just a taste of the mess the Bronco was in. Up against the bridge, backed up against a super steep river bank with the Bronco stuck in park and untold amounts of debris underneath potentially causing issues, she just wasn't budging. However, later that day was when I first got in touch with J.F. Dupree, who was planning on organizing a crew to come up that night and help. Speaking to him on the phone, he definitely gave me some reassurance that they would indeed be able to get the Bronco free. But what condition it would be in after the recovery, it was anyone's guess. But by most accounts, it wasn't looking good.